Eric, how are you? Good, sir. Hey, what's going on, Chris? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Yes, uh, surviving all the madness, I, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. It's been going on for some time now. Just, yeah. just on to the next one. <laughs> well, I thought we'd do this as a sort of Global Veterans Alliance podcast because um, this is serious, seriously is a freedom issue. And I think... I think a lot of people might be focusing on Ukraine, but this same scenario has just been played out and played out and played out and constructed and fabricated and played out. And how fair is that on our generation? Well, all, all generations, but our generation have never known life without these um, fabricated wars in which right. in which uh not only the people that 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 die in their millions are victims of it but also those of us that we just want a happy life and right but by happy i mean we want to be i don't know in tune with the nature we want to have good relationship with our family and our friends we want to get along with all human beings because you know we share a planet and we're all kind of made of the same stuff believe it or not and this chance to live a harmonious um or to live in harmony with the environment and to fulfill our potential as human beings it's been stolen from us by these everyone's gonna have their different take on it but let's just say these corporate trillionaires um who've clearly have an agenda because you see it played out again and again um once you become right. once you become aware of it it's kind of hard not to see so thank you for joining me major eric gums formerly united states marine corps eric's seen combat himself and eric's joined me today so we can try to put some sense or as much sense as we can as to what is going on in Ukraine surrounding Ukraine with respect to the the history of the country and the multitude of factors that are involved in understanding what essentially is going on there so yes Eric over to you yeah, so it's 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 really a, a very deep, complex, long running history. Um, with you know, I, I can kind of start by explaining it <clears throat> between U.S. and and Russian foreign relations. Um, so, I guess I'll start off with. Um, a, a real quick little known fact right before the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev sent a letter in 1986 to our then president, Ronald Reagan. And they had been having talks. Um, they, they talked at Geneva and then they, they started holding discussions in Reykjavik as well. But the final letter that Mikhail Gorbachev sent to President Ronald Reagan was a call, a, a legitimate, honest um, call for the complete and total nuclear disarmament of both the United States and Russia by the year 2000. That was offered. That was offered. And our president turned it down. It was probably one of the greatest offerings of peace uh, and, and something that would have absolutely benefited all of humanity. Um, and, and we, we kind of failed on that. And if you follow, uh, fast forward, uh, another decade or so to the Clinton presidency, because, you know, Vladimir Putin, he's been, you know, president, president, uh, of Russia for going on almost 30 years now, I believe something like that. Um, and, Putin himself in a press conference described a meeting he had with President Bill Clinton. And keep in mind, 
the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Um, and, and, you know, us in the West, we're, we're NATO, and, and the entire purpose of NATO was to counter the Warsaw Pact, which is the Soviet Union and their satellite governments, right? So you fast forward to the Clinton presidency, and um, a discussion took place between Vladimir Putin and, and Bill Clinton. And Putin flat out asked him, you know, um, what do you think of Russia joining NATO? Flat out just asked him, said, what do you think about Russia joining NATO? And um, as, as Putin described, um, he was basically uh, got a, a very hesitant reaction from him. And essentially that, 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 that thought was, was turned away and turned down. Um, more than likely in, in, in Putin's own words, he said, basically, uh, I guess the United States still needs somebody to fight. And even some of our own generals said, well, the Soviet Union is gone. America needs a new enemy. I think it was Colin Powell who said that, right? And so you look at <clears throat> the current tensions in the Ukraine, and, and this is something that's been going on for about 15 years now as well, because Ukraine is, is a partner NATO nation. So they're not a full member uh, of NATO. They're, they're a partner nation. Um, and so they have been kind of in this discussion for around over a decade, let's call it over a decade, where they're saying, hey, you know, we're, we're thinking about joining NATO. Now, as Chris, you, you mentioned before, we, we've seen this situation play out before. So what does, what does that do for Russia? Putin uh, himself has publicly for over a decade said, you know, this is my line in the sand. This is the red line you shall not cross because if you make them a NATO country and you start installing your militaries and your weapons, um, you know, and obviously with NATO membership, there comes the possibility of, you know, the installation of, of nuclear uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, military bases, all that kind of stuff. And they are literally right next to, to Russia. And I say that because I, I want to draw a parallel um, to a a little further back episode of American history, um, and, and this is during Kennedy's presidency in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, um, <clears throat> the United States had the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the communist revolution took over in Cuba. And Cuba is less than 100 miles off the Florida coast, right? They sit right off the United States. And the Russians, they were building up, um, you know, nuclear missiles uh, infrastructure. And the United States got intelligence saying that the Soviet Union had a naval, um, uh, a naval convoy that was transporting nuclear missiles to be installed off the coast of the United States. Uh, you know, and so Kennedy's reaction was, you know, fire up the military. We've got to, we've got to put a military blockade out there. So the United States Navy went out there. We did a, a naval blockade. And at the last minute, uh, the Russians turned away and, uh, you know, nuclear war was averted. And so, you know, you have all these people out there right now pointing the finger at Putin for being aggressive and all that kind of stuff, but you forget your own history because how, how did the United States react when you had a foreign aggressive force trying to deploy, you know, um, military material that could potentially strike the United States right off our own coast? Well, we reacted with deploying our military, right? And then we had a failed coup attempt with the Bay of Pigs invasion, where we used Cuban nationals to try and overthrow Fidel Castro as well. My dad was actually a part of that. <laughs> so um, I'm pretty well versed in this. So um, I think it's, it's good to discuss both perspectives, but in order to discuss those perspectives from a, a NATO perspective or a Russian perspective, you need to have a historical context because it, it's not that simple. No, exactly, Eric. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to sort of be playing a bit of devil's advocate here. Um, uh, for the simple reason, there's so many different angles and, and areas that could otherwise be glossed over. And I'll also try and um, highlight some of the history because some of our younger viewers won't be aware. So you just mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
which was an incredibly fame, uh, notorious incident in nuclear history. It, it, it was uh, almost, um, was it like one of the close calls to nuclear war? I think I think you could say. Yeah. Yeah. And also when we're talking about the Bill Clintons of this world, et cetera, et cetera, clearly puppets of a higher agenda. So we mustn't put too much weight on what a president says and doesn't say, because it's of ob it's obviously not coming from them as an individual. They're the like I say, they're the sort of puppet for something something much bigger aren't they right and ukraine's i mean it's got a fascinating history in itself um i've spent a couple of days just literally just researching ukraine's history and it's it's <laughs> no surprise it's pretty vast um yeah it throws up some interesting points I guess what we're essentially looking at now is after the breakup of the Soviet Union, so 1991, when Ukraine became an independent country. I say that hesitantly because it's um, it's uh, it's almost un unsure at times through history what what ukraine actually actually is right um, <clears throat> so 1991 berlin wall came down end of the soviet union um russia became russia ukraine uh had its independence and from then on do you think that the people of Ukraine, Eric, automatically made an attachment to the European Union in, in, in the years to follow because they saw it as the, the anti, as it were, to the Iron Curtain, like the Free West? Yeah. Um, well, that, that's, that, that question is also... Um has a complex answer um, because it, it depends on what area of Ukraine <clears throat> you're talking about. So for example, the Donetsk region uh, in Eastern Ukraine is hugely pro-Russia. Um, the, the absolute majority of the people who live there um, are, are very, very, very much pro-Russia and have been historically. And so basically uh, something else that the media is not talking about there there's something that happened in in the year 2014 in Ukraine called the orange revolution and the the orange revolution basically um installed new political leadership um which gives us president zelensky who is now the president of ukraine today and essentially he got rid of all of his political opposition uh, and and essentially his political opposition was pro russian right so um, <clears throat> for, for the better part of eight years, uh, he removed media outlets that were, you know, putting out anything against him and uh, imprisoned, imprisoned all of his, you know, essentially his political opposition, which has then also led to a kind of low intensity conflict slash civil war in Ukraine between basically Western Ukraine and Zelensky's government who are pro-NATO and the eastern part of Ukraine, which is pro-Russia. And so you have these, this war that, that's basically been going on and, and violence that, that has essentially been going on for eight years right now because the country is split on which direction they want to go. And so that in itself is, is, is another complexity to this issue where it's not just so cut and dry. Yes, the, the government wants right now to, to join NATO. Um, but the people are, are really kind of split. And you've seen videos over the last few days where the Russians came in and through Donetsk region 
And, um, you know, they, they see the Russians, the, the people in that region of, of Ukraine see the Russians as liberators because they're, they're getting what they want. They wanted to be a part of Russia. Um, and also Vladimir Putin then also signed a treaty recognizing Donetsk region's um, sovereignty as well, which is interesting, you know. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's some, some crazy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, gosh, where do we even start? Um, it's, I mean, geographically, Ukraine really is sandwiched between East and West. And right. depending on your age, uh, I'm guessing is how much influence, you, the, for example, the evils of communism, how much that affects our... Right our judgment of this issue because right. um, it, it, for, for the uninitiated, it could be tempting to gravitate towards the EU situation, couldn't it? You know, as, as I don't know, like the free West. Um, whereas when you look at Ukraine, it had a open trade agreement with Russia. Right. So, logic or common sense would say that they weren't in a bad position as they were and attempting to join the eu my understanding is they were stalled quite somewhat the the, the demands the eu were placing on ukraine meant it wasn't just a simple case of signing up it right de it, it delayed the process and so the actual government at the time put it on hold Right. Putin said, look, we don't mind you. I don't know how true this is, obviously, because I don't know his mind. But he said um, that we don't mind Ukraine joining the EU if that's their their choice. But we don't want to do it at the expense of us because we have an open trade agreement with Ukraine. Right. And if they sign up to the EU, then it's basically the, the EU through Ukraine will have open access to trade in Russia. And right. with, respect, with respect to the NATO issue, uh, Vladimir Putin put it quite simply. He said NATO is just an excuse for the USA to have a military base or military bases to, to expand their capability. And if we look at the neoconservative agenda, specifically the last 20 years or so, mm -hmm. yeah. um, going back to the, um, the, uh, what can we say? The, when, when we first, or a lot of us became aware of the neoconservative movement, the neocons. And they had that paper, didn't they? Um, before the events in New York, they brought out a paper called Rebuilding America's Defenses. And of interest in that was, um, well, it placed a focus on expanding America's military occupation worldwide or, or, or sorry, military um, capabilities worldwide. And then, of course, there was that line. It said, this will not come about easily unless we, yeah. ha unless we have a new Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, we saw the events um, back 20 years ago, didn't we? I'm trying not to say the number, folks, simply because it just gets, yeah. like, gets our... <laughs> yeah. It, it, it will get us um, demonetized immediately. Um, and so, yeah, we saw that and many observers will say neocons, AKA the Khazarian mafia. Yeah. Um, so you could understand why Putin wouldn't want Ukraine signing up to nato because essentially he could have nuclear weapons as you pointed out eric right on his doorstep yeah my question and i don't know if we'll ever get to the answer of this is 
how much is President Putin being played by this agenda? Or right. Ha- or how <clears throat> much does he know about this agenda? Well, I mean, he obviously knows about it. He's, he's a very smart guy. But to what extent is he a part of it? Or to what extent is he covering his own back by going along with certain things or whatever the case may be? Um, I mean, another question might be, to what extent is he impotent? And by that, I mean, if you look at George Bush um, in the events surrounding uh, what happened in New York 20 years ago, he was just like a rabbit caught in the headlights, wasn't he? You could clearly yeah. see he had no control over his his government. It had been infiltrated to such an extent that that they were able to... Um, let's just say, take complete control of the scenario. And he was just like, oh my God, it's kind of, it's happening. I'm the president and I just really don't know what to do. And then, then of course, he was told what to do. And he suddenly, he suddenly like got into gear and started going along with what, what I'd refer to as the uh, cough, cough agenda. So, yeah, will we ever know what Putin's position in all of this is? His 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 true one, because at the moment, it it genuinely looks like he's he's just been his back has been against the wall. He's had to act before Ukraine become part of Europe, and certainly before they come part part of NATO. Um. Because if he didn't, and they're a part of NATO, they can call up Article 5, which which is any country in NATO that comes under threat gets the full backing of all the rest of the countries in NATO. Right. And it's also interesting, these eastern provinces, um, the Donbass region, which clearly identify as Russian, uh, how much this plays a a, a bearing on on the situation yeah and you know so you bring up some really good points too i mean um you know there there's always more than one side to the coin right um and i think it's it it, it wouldn't be fair to talk unless you talked about both sides of it right can i just chip um, in there eric and say that yeah that- go ahead that yeah, if you watch mainstream media, there's two sides to this coin. It's pure and simple, and you 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 can just see people taking their side depending on what they're being fed by their news outlets. Right. What I'm saying here is there's a whole other level again, isn't there? That's really controlling Absolute. this controlling Absolute. this situation, pulling the strings way above the average Joe's head. Um. And on that point, I guess we should thank all those freedom lovers out there that have put the research in to get to that level of understanding. It was difficult 20 years ago. If you drew these conclusions, uh, not only did you get called absolutely crazy, but you had nobody to share it with. It was the early days of the internet. Um, You couldn't make such such sort of statements without coming under attack and full credit to the people that have lasted this 20 years and (laughs) and stuck to the freedom narrative because you know talking as a member of that of that group i just know how much flack you take um and now of course they're not people in the freedom movement aren't so isolated there's a lot more individuals, all on different levels of, can we say, awakenness. Um, and of course, Eric, what? How do we think this recent health issue plays into it? Many people would say, as that fell on its ass, I'm not saying this, but it could be argued that it 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 ran its course to a point where so many people were in objection to that narrative 
that it it could no longer go on. And then, of course, we get a major war to, some would argue, take people's minds off it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, the, the stuff that we've ended up having to go through over the last two years, I mean, it all changed because of political polling data. You know, the numbers right now that came out for Democrats in the United States said, um, you can keep pushing what you've pushed for the last two years, or you can accept the win and move forward, or you're going to get, you know, destroyed in our upcoming midterm elections in November. And so you just kind of see everything disappear, right? So this is with respect um, like it doesn't to, exist anymore. This is with respect um, to Biden, so yeah? This is Correct. With, this is yeah. with respect to Biden's party. He's very much obviously right. they've all gone along with this narrative. I'm to all intents and purposes, it looked like the guy doesn't know what day it is anyway. Um, I mean that no no I mean that no disrespect, but I mean come on, he's he's no, a, no, you're fine. A, a, allegedly <laughs> leader of the world's leading superpower. Um and they've they've installed someone there that's seriously ill um yeah it it it, it makes the whole of politics look like a laughing stock or, or or a sham or or allows people to see what it is um and you're saying that if they'd continued to push this narrative now that people were starting to poke serious holes in it they would have lost at the next election right. Yes, um, and that is that is the the source for that information is actually the the so each party does political research on people's opinions. So you might get a phone call, you might get a text message, and then they pull that data together to form an understanding of where Americans stand on certain issues. And then that polling data was recently released and made public, essentially. And so now you see. Um, politicians kind of change their tune and do a complete 180. It's for political reasons, right? And that ties into the same narrative right now that we're dealing with in the Ukraine. Now, you know, there's an old saying where the, the first casualty of war is, is, is truth, right? Because you have propaganda that's, that's spinning up, and, and this holds true in every single war that's ever existed, you know, one, both, both sides, they, they spin up their propaganda machines and they try to build the narrative that they're the good guys, that they're on the right side of things, right? And the, we, the means by which they do that nowadays is by control of social media, by the big tech oligarchs and uh, the, the, the corporate news media organizations. And, you know, um, <laughs> When I started looking into this, because um, you know I, I put out a video on my BitChute um, channel um, a few a few days ago over the weekend, where I, I was doing research trying to find combat footage and as much information as I could. You know, I, I have contacts in Europe, um, all over the place, all over the world, friends, friendships that I built, and they help feed me some information from time to time when I when I look for it. And what I found was. A lot of the, the mainstream media sources from the United States, Germany, Israel, UK, um, they were literally regurgitating old stock photos and videos. Um, one of the ones that you saw in pretty much every British newspaper um, over the weekend was a, a woman covered in blood behind a blown up apartment complex. And that was actually from a gas explosion years ago, right? And they tried to pass it off as, you know, it's the Ukraine. Or um, in the German, in the uh, the German news media, they tried to pass off a Chinese firework warehouse explosion uh, in Tianjin as you know something being blown up in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And now you know in the Israeli media they they used a, a video that included like a, a downed Tie fighter with you know Imperial stormtroopers from Star Wars as footage from the Ukraine. And it's just so blatant right now. Um, Can I say it, it something? It took me there, forever. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I, I just wanted to say, and I know I speak for a lot of people watching us now, when, when I look at that footage, even just to see the BBC logo, I'm, I'm not even considering this might be true. I, I just know it's a complete <laughs> yeah. whitewash job. And, and yeah. that is the function of, of, of the mainstream media. And off the back right. of the last two years, so many people have woken up to that to realize that the, the, the news stations aren't on your side. <laughs> they are they're completely not on your side. But what we forget is most people still, you know, the 99%, they still go along with that stuff. They still think yeah. it's the God's honest truth. I mean, to such an extent where... I I kind of find myself gravitating to people that don't live in that matrix anymore. Yeah. You know, I I really just I, I'm not I'm not being judgmental here. I'm just being honest from the heart. I I find it hard to be around that level of of um lack of awareness. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing the individual. If you've been indoctrinated since birth into this nonsense, I mean, it's 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 not people's fault, or so probably people out there are going to argue, yeah, oh yes, it is. They they need to stop calling people conspiracy theorists and actually, you know, wake up. But clearly, a significant percentage of the population are are never going to wake up, are they not? Right. Well, I mean, it's all psychology, you know, um, and when you're when you have so much backing and it, they, they make it so impossible to really even find the truth of whatever it is, it doesn't matter what the issue is. You know, if, if they're trying to cover something up, they bury it so far that, you, you know, it's almost impossible to research it. Um, and, and you really just have to over the years develop you know, your sources to where you go to, to really dig into it yourself. Um, I'll give you a really good resource there. There's a website called Tin Eye, T-I-N-E-Y-E. And so if you, if you see um, documents or photos or videos online or from mainstream media sources, you can go to that website, Tin Eye, and you can upload those images. It could be, you could even take a screenshot from the picture you're looking at on your phone and upload that picture. And what Tinai does is it does a complete and total web search from news media, from social media, from you know everything you can think of. And it will show you where that picture and that video has been used before. It will probably blow your mind. It will probably blow your mind. And, you know, it, it's a rabbit hole, I'll tell you, because once you start using it, uh, you, you can't stop. <laughs> so does that use um, some sort it's of it's a really good resource. Does that use some sort of recognition software? Like, does it scan the pixels and then reference it with other photos that are out there? Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and it, it'll pull up things from Twitter. It'll pull up you know, feeds from Facebook, it'll pull up YouTube videos, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's where a lot of this propaganda is, is, is being debunked, you know, because people are doing the research and they're reverse uploading images and then having them, you know, you can become your own fact checker and totally blow out, you know, the mainstream media's narratives of what they're trying to do. And it's really simple. It's free. You don't need to sign up for anything. You just go to the website and there it is. Hey, it says upload, upload your image. Here you go. And you can, you can fact check for yourself. Um, so it's, it's really a, a great resource to kind of see through, you know, the, the BS, if you will. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Eric, if it's okay with you. I'm, I'm just going to scan through a few photos here for our wonderful public out there because I put some, I put some aside here that kind of sum up ukraine's history obviously not in its yeah. entirety it's just a, a brief glimpse right. folks um but it could be it could be interesting because i i reckon there's a lot about of ukraine's history that people would just be unaware of so let me just get my desktop up um 
So this statue, I believe it's in the Maidan Square, which was the scene of the Orange protest, which, which led to the Orange Revolution. Um, this chap, can't remember his name, but he was the guy that, um, let me see, he, he was the guy that gave crime, was it, um, ah, I'm going to talk myself into, into a corner here, but, um, he was the guy that I think gave Crimea its independence from uh, from Russia in the first place, or from the Soviet Union rather in the first place. And obviously, that's another issue that we mm. haven't haven't even yet discussed is um, the annexing of Crimea. Right. A um, lot of lot of history, like we say, folks in this country. Um, fierce history of, of fighting to to um, defend itself as a as a this isolated country the flag's interesting it's a beautiful story behind the flag the the blue of the flag is supposed to represent their kind of pristine skies and the yellow is to represent the abundance of their harvest so the the um the wheat harvest, I'm, I'm guessing. Mm. Um, slide here is going back to Kazaria because obviously this region, if you if you talk about uh, a thousand AD, it was the home of the Khazars, who were um, eventually moved on and fled into Europe because of the pressure from their neighbours to stop their uh, devious and criminal behaviour, we can, we can say. And of course, it's from those Khazars that allegedly, I'm just uh, remaining neutral here for the purpose of the show, but allegedly formed the, the Khazarian Mafia that, uh, again, allegedly are behind global events. Um, this is the e e o u um dun dun, dun is that have I or e e o n let me see if I got some notes here um dun 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 this was kind of the organization of ukrainian nationalists because this is another thing that 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 people probably aren't aware of is they've got quite a significant nationalist movement there and by nationalist i'm i'm talking about edging on um uh, what what we'd call extreme right wing um Although when you see the history of this country, you can almost you you can understand where it where it comes from. Um, so they had a leader, the OUN, back in 1940. So at the start of the war, and he was massively uh, this Ste Stefan Bandera was massively, um, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this, but he was massively against the Jews, basically. Um, that's the kind of one of the things he's, he's known for. And what people probably aren't aware of is in the Second World War, huge swathes of Ukrainian society formed regiments and, and battalions under the SS so for for Germany um, and I believe if I understand this correctly there were some kind of holocausts that took place there um, 
that were on a par with 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 that uh, that of Europe. Um, so yeah, and interestingly, during the Nuremberg trials, sorry folks, I'm stuttering here a bit because it really is so much to to take in, especially with my uh, my uh, quick visit over the course of two days. But during the Nuremberg trials, these uh, individuals that were leading the um, military stance that sided with Germany were conveniently given immunity from prosecution. Um, so this guy, Stefan Bandera, was relocated in the United States. And when it was asked, well, hang on, if these guys are responsible for the annihilation of, of all these Jews, why, why are they getting off it and the CIA's answer was well it's because they kind of overall they're a, a USA asset right you know uh, because they fought against Germany and that I'm guessing was the CIA keeping the informants in the country sweet or, or sort of playing an espionage, you know, playing a diplomatic espionage move because of the country's unique position between here and here and Russia. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in fact, here's a write up. CIA later informed the Immigration and Naturalization Service that it had concealed Stefan Bandera and other Ukrainians from the Soviets. Um, this is so when the Soviets swept into Europe, they didn't take out these these guys that were heading up the the German S <laughs> SS battalions of their own. Um, Uh, luckily, the Soviet attempt to locate these anti-Soviet Ukrainians was sabotaged by a few far-sighted Americans who warned the persons concerned to go into hiding. The agency cited the Ukrainian resistant movement's struggle against the Soviets and believed that, in uh, inverted commas, the main activities of the OUN in Ukraine cannot be considered detrimental to the United States. By 1951, the agency excused the illegal activities of OUN security branch in the name of Cold War necessity. <laughs> so this is almost like an Operation Paperclip sort of thing going on here, but but. Uh, whereas Operation Paperclip was to do with the rocket scientists and the formation of NASA, this, right? This is to do with some um, serious what uh, serious war crimes. I'm, I'm trying is what I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, then we get the Cold War developing after the Second World War. Uh, then we have Perestroika, wasn't it, under Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, I'm sure it didn't come from him personally, but the narrative was played out that there was starting to become peace talks with him and Ronald Reagan, so between America and the Soviet Union, which um, at the same time, there was the Narodny Ruk, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it was the people's movement in U in Ukraine um, that formed. And then, of course, the Berlin Wall came down in, was it 91? I believe it was, Eric. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then here we go. We got this chap. 
see if I can find his name. Um, bum, bum, bum. Oleg Tianibok. Again, I'm sure I've not pronounced that right, folks, but um, 1991 sees the rise of far-right extremist independent organisations. Um, again, I'm, I'm saying that if they're, they're written up in the literature as far-right, but of course, from their perspective, they might well be doing what they... They, they might be centre is what I'm trying to say. Um, leader of Svoboda, Svoboda, a nationalist freedom party uh, against USSR. Um, dun, 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 what else have we got here? Well, there is some truth to that. Um, if you look up the Ukrainian Azov battalion, um, these guys are basically openly neo-Nazis, like on, on President Zelensky's political side of the, of the spectrum. Um, they have Ukrainian flags with swastikas and all that stuff. And you can find open source if you if you if you just duck, duck, go um, the Azov battalion, you'll find pictures of those guys. Yeah, and we've and it, and there were other groups um spawned as well eric so we've got this the right sector right um led by this guy here dimitri yarosh and it's very interesting let me get us back it's really interesting there's two documentaries folks and i suggest watching both of them that that focused on the orange revolution one is called um uh, is it winter? Uh, let me just find it. I can't for the life of me remember what they're called, but um, basically two documentaries made. One was by Oliver Stone, which seemed to have a fair amount of um, objectivity to it. Like he interviewed Putin and Putin seems to be fairly open, um, open in his his sort of answers to to um, Oliver Stone's questions, and there there was another documentary I believe it was called Winter in Ukraine, so Oliver Stone's documentary doesn't get a look in on, for example, Wikipedia, which kind of I think there's a bit of a clue there. <laughs> Whereas the other documentary does get gets a complete write up, and obviously the one that gets that gets the write up on Wikipedia is the one pushing the narrative that we're we're now seeing come to fruition. Um, is that making sense, Eric? Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. If it's, it's easy it's, if it's easy to found. If, it, if it's if it's at uh, you know if it's at the top of your Google search, chances are there's something there's something funky going on there. Yeah, if exactly. it's easy to find. Probably not true. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna search. I'll hand over to you, Eric. And um, oh yeah, so winter on fire. Um, was one of the documentaries. Um, that's the one that's written up on Wikipedia. And in Winter on Fire, one specific thing that was uh, mentioned was it... Uh, 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 it, it conveniently glossed over all the far right symbolism, so the swastikas, etc., etc. And when you understand how those far right elements were being controlled, 
then you can see it was the same system that has been used to implement revolution all over the world. So the Arab Spring, um, you know, what's that? Libya, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, again, so basically a, 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 um, a strategy of the Khazaria Mafia is what we're trying to say, or, or, or the neocons. Have you seen either yeah. of these documentaries, Eric? So one is, um, sorry, I was just saying there, wasn't I? One is Winter on Fire, and the other one is Ukraine on Fire. Both well worth watching, but fascinating to see. No, I, I, have, not, I have not seen them, but um, just being a student of history, I, I, know enough of, I know enough to be dangerous, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, really, you know, when, when you look at war and stuff like that, you know, depending on how you form your own opinions and what information you decide to consider, the reality is, is that war ultimately happens because one or more countries have failed foreign policies with one another. And, you know, the reasoning behind that, there's, there's a multitude uh, of higher level things that are going on than just you know, a president or something like that. I agree. Um, un and unfortunately, you know, a lot of times we get involved in the politics and the blame game and, and you know, um, looking into propaganda and, and who lied and what documents and all that kind of stuff. But you, you have to remember that it, there, there's a human element here. Because at the end of the day, you know, the, the people of, of that country you know, the, the regular ordinary folks who live in the Ukraine, they, they don't want to they don't want war. They, they don't want to see their kids blown up in the streets. They don't want to starve to death or be victimized by one side or the other. You know, they're, they're just kind of caught in the middle. You know, your, your homes could be destroyed. You could lose your kids, your husband, your wives, you know, your daughters. And the one thing that I can universally agree upon with just about anybody is that anytime war hits somewhere it's ultimately the people who live there that that will suffer you know regardless of who's at fault or who's to blame you know the the one thing that's universal with war is is human suffering and the other so thing we, I, I side with those people <laughs> yeah and the other thing we have to point out is it's further obfuscation so further confusion of understanding who we are as as human beings and what I mean by that is it's, it's furthering the notion that we're all these individual identities as opposed to one collective. So when I look at you, Eric, I'm not really seeing Eric Gums, you know, former USMC, he's an American, I'm British. He's this, I'm that. I, I don't see that division. What I see is my own flesh and blood in another, uh, in another of nature's wonderful creations, experiencing the world over there in the way that you are. And I'm just, I'm just life experiencing itself here. Right. And when you come to understand the universe in these terms, then you understand the complete futility of war because it's one part of the universe going to war with, with itself is what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's complete nonsense. And while we, we have these, um, these nutcases in charge of, we're in charge of our affairs and making these decisions on, not on our behalf, but on behalf, allegedly on behalf of countries, they're ultimately not just, like you say, um, putting upon poor innocent people just, just huge suffering. But while they're doing it, they're, they're further hiding the fact that we are all one. And until we, we learn to start 
viewing life through that perspective that we are all one. We're going to keep falling for this identity trap and this identity politics and this Russia versus the USA, you know, UK versus, you know, Argentina, whatever. It's, um, it's a huge distraction from ever learning who, who we really are. Yeah. And I mean, if, if you think about it, right, like you, you look at the war that we just waged in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, it costs U.S. taxpayers something like $60 million a day for 20 years. And then we sit and we say, huh, why are people, why, why, why do people go without food in Africa, right? Like, why are people starving anywhere in the world at that point? Or in our own country, for that matter, because we have, we have people who don't have health care, they, they can't feed their children or support themselves, right? And you sit there and you tell me, look, we, we just spent $60 million a day for 20 years. The cost of that war is astronomical. And the cost of that war did nothing more than drain the resources and the, and the fruits of the labors of the people all of, of every country involved and diverted it for a destructive purpose instead of something that could have benefited humanity, I guess. You know, you could, you could have basically put that money into just about anything else and it would have been put to better use than, than making war. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's those, those wars really are, are, a touchy subject for me because I, I have my own personal ideas about the backgrounds and all of that, but I, I won't get into that. Uh, that's, that's maybe a topic for another video, but when you just look at the sheer cost of it and you have people, you know, here in America who are suffering from drug addiction or psychological issues or broken families or, you know, stuff like that, people who, who can't afford just basic things, right. Or, just upgrading infrastructure to make quality of life better or give poor families tax breaks um, so that they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and become independent and not dependent, you know, stuff like that. And all of that added to our national debt too, which, you know, I think we're at like $26 trillion in debt right now. And so it, it's, it's really pretty insane that people think that America really has some sort of capability to wage a world war right now when you're 26 trillion dollars in debt how how are we going to pay for that how are we going to pay how are, you, how are you even going to pay for that right now you know what i mean my great grandchildren won't have paid off 26 trillion all right so where does the money come from to do all the funding to run a global war yeah we're going to end up like the soviet union we're going to end up like the soviet union it's or it it's over you know so eric let's <laughs> Yeah. Let, let's come to a close on two points. So the first is, can we consider how is this going to end? Secondly, can we consider how would it be beneficial to end? Do you understand the difference between the two? Yeah. Yeah. So how is it likely to end, i.e. with the mainstream narrative, etc cetera, etc cetera. how can it end but the second um uh area to look at is what would be an ideal ending so maybe we start with the first yeah so honestly um just kind of keeping track of the russian military's progress um i think the way it's going to end is that it's 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 going to end quicker than you know NATO or the European Union can really react in time to, I guess, drum up public support with the use of propaganda and stuff like that to justify taking military action against Russia, right? Um, and all of these sanctions that they're doing right now. Um, I think are actually going to come back and bite Europe because most of Europe, Germany, you know, I, I think Germany is probably the best example is 70% of all of their um, energy needs are satisfied by Russia, right? So now you're, you're sanctioning the person you're completely dependent on. And actually, President Trump mentioned this, you know, a few years ago during his presidency that Germany 
buys 70% of its coal, oil, and natural gas from Russia, right? And now you're going to sanction them. How is that going to work out in the end? I, I think it's going to end up working out poorly for them. Um, uh, the ideal situation would have been that Russia and NATO would have perhaps allowed some of these Eastern European countries to be just neutral or, or become their own group um, in the world politics and military of themselves to, to maintain a neutral buffer zone between NATO and Russia, right? You, you could create a different coalition of, of Eastern Bloc countries that are between, you know, Western Europe and Eastern and, and Russia, you know, that kind of builds a border between them and their neutrality needs should have been or could be, you know, respected by both sides as, you know, kind of the neutral party arbiter between East and West, you know? Yeah, they could become their own little economic union, couldn't they? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to think where this... Um, where, where it's going to end up. It, I mean, it's interesting that you've got this Donbass region in the east where people really do um, affiliate them or recognize themselves as being Russian. Right. Um, because could we end up in a situation where those two regions are annexed by Russia in the same way that, that Crimea has been, or perhaps that's even, that was Putin's intention all along, is to sort of lay his claim to this area. And then we'll see him withdraw from the other areas, or is this, is he in for a penny, in for a pound? This is all out, an all out bid to overtake the running of the country. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, the, the reports that, that I've seen, you know, from, from Russia over the, the past, you know, few days, week, is once, you know, they, they, essentially what they've said is once the military, oper military operations objectives are concluded, um, they intend to withdraw. Now, what that means for Donbass region, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I will I will kind of say this, um, and you can kind of draw uh, a conclusion based on previous history when you when you look at um, you know the end of colonialism uh, from European countries in, in Africa where they just kind of drew these lines on a map and said, okay, your people are here, your country is here in this box, and it, it cuts people off from their own cultural ethnic groups and and they're separated then by a border and these borders were created with you know no real thought into um where people really are congregated uh, based on you know ethnicity or race or religion and stuff like that which has led to endless conflicts and genocide in africa for decades on end and has led to an absolute nightmare for African countries to try and kind of sort out amongst themselves. And, you know, you, you kind of have the same situation in the Ukraine where, you know, you have this civil war going on between East and West Ukraine, one's pro-Russia, one's pro-NATO, and they've been fighting and killing each other for, you know, eight plus years, right? And so uh, the reality is, is that countries have borders, and, and the reason why they have borders is because Typically, those borders are created to separate people who are culturally uh, incompatible with one another. And so those borders are really kind of the things that keep the peace. So you don't see this kind of ethnic violence and, and genocide that kind of brews once one side uh, gets enough rhetoric or propaganda behind them and becomes the majority and then takes out the minority, right? And so I think for stability purposes, you know, I, I'm all about, um, you know, people who are wanting to be part of this other country, maybe we should let them, you know, um, but I hope that either way that it's a democratic process and that the people are able to choose for themselves what they want, because that's freedom, right? Um, I don't support Putin just simply taking it. 
Um, I, I think that if, if the people in the Donbass region want to be part of Russia, then they should have a free election uh, and decide for themselves democratically to do so, should they so choose. Yes. Yeah, so what are we saying here about Russia's intention then? Come occupying the country long enough to what? To stabilize the government in its favor and then withdrawing? Or or how does it work? Because like I say, it just seems to be in for a penny, in for a pound. I mean Yeah. The technically or whatever the word is, they've invaded. Um, so what, what, what exactly do you think they're trying to achieve? So I think, I other, think it's, it, sorry, go other, ahead. other than the obvious, you know, we, 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 we get it that they're objecting to NATO and, and, right. um, and that, that having this on their doorstep, we get that, but, how will doing what they're doing, what, what's the way out of it to achieve what they're trying to achieve, but also, right. also to ultimately get to, a, to peace, back to peace, back to stability? Right. So by default, you know, the, the Russians don't just have a, a problem with NATO. They, they also have a problem with Zelensky's government, right? So you have President Zelensky and then all of his cabinet and ministers that run you know, the country, um, if I were Putin, you know, you can't, you can't just let these people stay in power, right? Because they're just going to start this back up all over again. And so, uh, in my opinion, a military objective would be, these guys would be high value targets, you know, HIVs uh, or HVIs, high value individuals. And they would definitely be going after these politicians that, you know, kind of put Ukraine into the situation as being pro-NATO because they're part of the problem for Russia as well. And so you're going to have to remove these people. Um, and what, what they do with them, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they get put on trial. Maybe it's a, a military tribunal. Maybe they, maybe they go to the old Russian gulag. I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, you, you try to install somebody in that government who is a little bit more pro-Russia or, you know, neutral, right? But I, I don't think occupation is the goal here because um, as we found out and as Russia found out, you know, in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq, you know, if you try to occupy something, uh, another country and, and stay there forever, it, it basically turns into, you know, an insurgency problem where you've got people coming in, foreign fighters from other countries that are now trying to delegitimize the government yet again. And it just it just spins out of control and you end up sitting there and bleeding out for a decade. Right. Like what we just did. Uh, and, and the Russians are, are should be well aware of their mistakes that they made in Afghanistan as well. And so I don't think a long term occupation is the goal here. I think it's really just kind of um, take the people out that have been pushing towards the NATO button and going against Russia's interests and rebuild it back up with either somebody who is, again, pro Russia or perhaps the best case scenario in my mind would be to show neutrality and just kind of leave Ukraine alone, you know, that I, I would hope that we would find somebody who's neutral to avoid this in the future, right? Do you think it would, oh, well, I mean, it, it would surprise a lot of people in the West to realize that, that, um, I mean, that this, this is in their best interest. I mean, it, oh, sorry, to the other side of the coin, rather, it, it's not in their best interest to allow the neocons to further you know, force their agenda on the world. In this instance, yeah. by, by Ukraine becoming a part of NATO, like you say, why the hell do we still have NATO? Um, but Ukraine becoming a part of NATO and then allowing American armaments in that country right on Russia's border antagonistically. And I mean, it's not, it's not a good scenario for anyone. Right. And yet it's the, foolish. Yeah. And yet the media have managed to spin it. Obviously that's what they do to sell it to the public that this is in their best interest. Um, crazy. 
And one other thing, Eric, that we haven't even uh, mentioned is how does this all this fit in with the Belt and Road Initiative? You know, that's that's a whole other discussion in itself. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this for for friends at home who who aren't aware that the Belt and Road is this um, it's this super highway between east and west. So from Beijing, essentially, to to Europe, it's a super highway of all things, Um, resources, manpower, communications, transport, et cetera, et cetera. For those that can, that are watching the podcast, you can see the blue line is the overland route. Interesting to see how it it, um, passes close by to Ukraine. And the red is the sea route. And I think any observer, Eric, would say, this is kind of part of the... the the 1984 shaping of the world. And as such, a world war now would really screw up the plans for the belt, for the belt and road. So it would hint that world war three is not, that's not what we're talking here. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. um, You know, for, for the most part, the, the reality is, is that most people are actually against getting involved militarily with this conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. Now, you're going to see the mainstream media put out polls and they're going to say, well, you know, 77 percent of Americans support, you know, war with Russia. That's that's not true. It, it, it's pretty much the opposite of that. It, it, you have maybe maybe 20 percent who would who would agree with some form of military action. Because the reality is, is if they had that kind of public support, they'd already be there. They'd already be, they'd already be there, you know? So um, basically, I I don't think that this is going to end in World War III. I think what we're going to see is a lot of posturing, a lot of rhetoric, um, you know, from, from Western, you know, democracies, (laughs) Um, you know, here, you know, the United States and, and Western Europe. Um, and, and they'll condemn and, and say, you know, Russia is bad and all that stuff. And they'll continue to play basically the same narrative that they played against Russia, you know, since the beginning of the Cold War. Right. <laughs> you know, they've said the same things about Russia for, you know, the better part of 80 years. So um, nothing really has changed. They'll slap on some sanctions for Russia. Russia will wait out those sanctions and will return to the status quo as it will. Yeah. Eric, are you familiar with um, Bunting's Cloverleaf map? I'm not. Um, one sec. See if I can pull it up. Uh, uh, uh. Um, one second. Yeah, for friends at home, I'm just going to get a picture of it up um i gotta save it first i've just got a fo- folder called poking the bear mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all it's all going in there at the moment a lot of stuff's going in there anyway um let me just see if i can get this up Yeah, this is with respect to the kind of Orwellian like uh, infrastructure the world's being developed into, if it makes sense. And this was a map by, um, I believe he was a pastor, like a vicar, right? Um, And... He lived uh, fairly some time ago. In fact, let me just um, let me just get that up. And and what he said is um, he he came up with this map, and it was his prediction of how 
the world was going to be shaped by by our controllers. Um, let me just let me just read read you this. Heinrich Bunting was a German. Um, this is in time the Times of Israel, by the way, folks. There's the map. So it's a it's a clover leaf map, Eric. It's it's got Europe as one leaf. It's got Asia as a as a, as another leaf, and it's got Africa as the third leaf. America being totally separate in this equation, and then it's got Israel as the center. So it's kind of hinting at three um, global super states controlled by Israel in the middle. Um, And it says here, Heinrich Bunting was a German Protestant pastor, theologist, and cartographer. And in his masterpiece, um, Travel Through Holy Scripture, in 1581, so this is going back some time, he portrayed the world that, that mattered comprised of three continents of Europe, Asia and Africa with each depicted as a clover leaf. They converged in Jerusalem and the rest of the world was irrelevant. It's quite interesting that f- this is 400 years ago he predicted what what we'd come to know as Orwell's 1984. Um, <laughs> And like I say, you can see there, so Asia would be Russia and China being banded together, wouldn't it? Europe Europe would be the European Union, obviously, and, and hence the need for our European army. Um, in the Orwellian future, it's all about living in a constant state of war with these three super states always played off against each other or at least through the media through big brother to keep the public in its place to keep them living in fear essentially um and is that kind of not what we're seeing do you think that that's uh that's a reason for cementing this last little part of NATO right up to the border of um, a, a fabricated enemy. Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, what I can say is, you know, history is, is, is trying to repeat itself. You know, um, if you look at events that, transpired leading up to World War II. Um, you know, there, there are versions of history that you learn in school, and there are versions of history that you learn by doing your own research. There are similarities of kind of, you know, the setup, if you will. Draw a parallel to Ukraine being like, the Poland, you know, what happened with Poland in World War II, whereas Ukraine is now the modern day Poland, right? Um, in this scenario, when you're comparing World War II to current events. Um, fortunately, though, um, I think that we are kind of in a situation where enough people kind of get it, um, where I, I think that we can avoid another global war and hopefully we can restrict this to a short you know, a short conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And and my hope is really that, you know, the the people and the suffering is is as limited as possible. You know, you're always going to have civilian casualties when when you're at war. It's unavoidable. Um, But I hope that the suffering isn't prolonged and I I hope it's kept to a minimum and that we, after this is done, reach some type of peaceful resolution with each other uh, to avoid sticking other countries in the middle of, you know, this, these, these global powers that are constantly competing against one another. So that, that's, that's really, I guess, my, my greatest hope um, is that we can just 
find a peaceful solution to this and not draw it out forever. Yeah, that ties in with the second part of my um, wanting to draw this to a close. What would be a, an ideal, an ideal scenario? And I think now, Eric, people are just fed up. A lot of people on mass are now fed up with this. This let's just call it the neocon agenda. This constant state of war. Yeah. This constant state of manipulating the media this constant state of treating the public like they're idiots. And sadly, if members of the public are idiots, it's only because they've been indoctrinated their whole life to, right. you know, like that, um, like that film, wasn't it? Idiocracy. Have you ever seen that movie? Yeah. 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 It's classic. Oh God. <laughs> it's classic. Yeah. What an accurate. I'm a big Terry Crews fan too. So yeah, it's a great movie. What an accurate portrayal of where, of you know, how life's progressing to get to this state of humanity where people have just become so dumb. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just think people are fed up with this now. This isn't a joke. It's, it's not like our life. We get two or three run throughs at, at this. I mean, not right. it. Not in this set of molecules, folks, you know, in this set of molecules referred to as Chris Thrall or, or Eric Gums. All we've ever known is war and conflict and the greed of, of, of this minority that insists on trying to control the narrative and working towards their, their uh, can we say, world order. and we don't get this life back. You know, we don't get being locked in our homes for two years. We don't get that time back. We don't get the effect on our human psyche of constantly being subjected to war. Um, having it in, in our media for the last 20 years, um, being subjected to that horrendous death count consistently and we don't want our children to have to grow up with this it's like it's gone too far now i mean it always was too far but now so many people can see yeah. it so many people can see it and i'll say to folks out there please you got the links here for the global veterans alliance come on board with us and help make a difference if we don't start saying no to this this evil that's all it's pure evil then our children are just going to have to live through the same um fear agenda that we've all been subjected to and i i just think eric don't you think it's just time to start saying no right and i i mean you know the the last thing that i guess i'll leave you guys with is is this you know if if the last two years you know, you realize that the things that the people making decisions in your government and the people giving you the information on the media. Awakening, right? Realizing that not everything is as they tell you it is, right? And you've started to question things and, and start to disbelieve the propaganda that's been pushed on you. Then why would you believe them on on this subject, right? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're they're telling the truth again. You know, um, to me that that doesn't really it doesn't really make sense. Um, and so, the the best thing that I can say is continue questioning things and don't believe everything you see, and try to at least verify whatever you can uh, on your own um, and, and do a little bit of background research yourself because that, that goes a long way. And the other important thing is, is to have these discussions with your own children and to make sure that you're raising your own kids properly so that they learn so that they don't become part of the problem in the future too. You know, education is a never ending process and you need to dedicate your life to it. So that's pretty much, um, hope for peace and then support, support peace, you know, 
So that, that's pretty much all I can say on that, I guess, in closing. Yeah, and I'll close with two things. The first, echoing your sentiments there, Eric, is if it doesn't project peace, love, kindness, empathy, and a shared compassion for humanity globally, then it's not in your best interest. Once someone starts banging those war drums, it is not in anyone's best interest. It's part of an agenda that doesn't suit you or I as the, the, the you know, the common individual, can we say? And like I said before, it's time to start saying no to it. And the other thing I'm going to say is, Major Eric, massive thank you for, for joining us again and for all your all your support. Um, folks, if you could like and subscribe to the channel, that would really help us. It's a difficult subject to cover. There's a lot of um, unpleasantness, can we say? A lot of unpleasant factors, but we try to bring them to you in as open a manner as possible. We might not have it all right, so feel free beneath the video to leave your comment. Please be respectful obviously always because this is the, the the future we're creating for our young people here but you're welcome to contribute if you think there's something that we've neglected to overlook and we'll try and cover it in in another video and um that being said massive love to you all please look after yourselves turn off that mainstream media and uh, we'll see you in a bright future